So, good evening, everyone. Here we are again, reading the Gospel of Mark. I am Father David, and I'm speaking to you from the Jesuit Institute in Johannesburg, South Africa. For those who might be joining for the first time, what we do is we hear a presentation of a text for about 45 minutes, and then there is time to pose questions or make comments, which you do by writing in the chat. And Ursula, the director of the Institute at the moment, will be helping me uh, sort through the questions and comments, and we will have 15 minutes to do that. We are doing this on a special day today, reading the Gospel of Mark again on the Feast of St. Mark. And so I'd like to start with something special. The Feast of St. Mark today. Um, I would like to um, play a, a hymn in Arabic. There is a little bit in Coptic. And this is an icon of St. Mark from the Coptic tradition. It's a pretty modern icon, but you see Mark and the lion, and behind Mark's lion, you see a church that represents the Church of Egypt, because among other things, Mark is also the founder, according to tradition, of the church in Egypt. And so let us begin with this special prayer, praying that the Spirit will enlighten our time together as we study the Gospel of Mark on this feast of St. Mark, but also praying for the um, descendants of that first church in Egypt that Mark founded. And you will see that it is, in fact, an Easter song. The words in Coptic that appear at the beginning and the end is very similar to Greek. Christos anesti, alethos anesti. And then in Arabic, al masih kam, bil haqiqati kam. There will be other words, but let's just pray together without perhaps understanding all of those words, um, that we be enlightened and that God really be with the Church of Egypt. Shamsur Gailahat, what a bull 
Good evening once again. Here we are with Mark and his book of the gospel. And again, we repeat as each week to remind ourselves that this is a carefully composed first century Greek language, literary, spiritual, and theological text inspired by the scriptures of Israel based upon the life of Jesus of Nazareth, following the writings of Paul of Tarsus, the first of the books of the gospel, and a source for the other books. Let's now see where we have reached in our reading. So title, opening, introduction, the first day. And last week, we read a very brief text beginning in chapter 1, verse 40, ending in verse 45, that I presented as an introduction to a new part of Mark's uh, book, and I have titled it The Beginning of the Opposition. Now, the beginning of the opposition is a very, very important part of the story, and we are going to spend four weeks, in other words, the four weeks that are left, going through this, but in a very different way than we've done until now. Tonight, we are going to read the entire text, beginning in chapter 2. We will not repeat what we read last week, but beginning in chapter 2 and ending in verse 6 of chapter 3. Let's look at the structure, and then we will hear this text. I will read it slowly, hopefully meditatively, and this will serve as a basis for the next four weeks, in fact, the last four weeks of the present series of this reading of Mark's uh, story. So here it is, the opposition, the opposition to Jesus. And you remember that last week we read the curing of the leper. I remind you that the beginning of that narrative did not surprise us. A leper comes to Jesus and says, if you want, you can. And the Jesus we have encountered in chapter one is a Jesus who certainly can. He is like God. He can do anything. And so he says, I do want, and he cures the leper. Nothing surprising there. But then, again, not a surprise, he says to the leper, be silent. And you'll remember then the turn. The leper is not silent. And Jesus whom we thought was omnipotent, who could do anything, is described as he could not enter the town. And we were shocked by that. He could not. Jesus, in a certain sense, has taken on the leprosy of the leper, now cured. Jesus is outside. Now, what we have from the beginning of chapter 2 until verse 6 in chapter 3 of five episodes of opposition in Galilee. I'll read the titles and then we'll read the texts. A paralytic is carried in by his friends. You'll remember that wonderful story. We'll hear it in a moment. Then the story of Levi, the calling of Levi who follows Jesus and Jesus feasts in his house. Then the question of fasting. And right at the center, a strange text, not easy to understand, and we will not be taking on this text tonight. We will deal with it in two weeks' time. The relationship between the new and the old. And I will already suggest that this is the central message of this entire piece about opposition. What is the relationship between the new that is bursting in and the old that is already there? and having some trouble accepting the new. Then we have a fourth narrative, plucking grain on the Sabbath. And then finally, the section will end with the man with the withered hand. I point out already that in this very structured text, as we will see, it's good to see ahead that in Jerusalem, here Jesus is in Galilee, five episodes of opposition in Galilee, there will be, at the end of chapter 11 and through chapter 12, five episodes of opposition in Jerusalem. Again, we are learning something very important about who Jesus is and that 
which is very important, is that Jesus, this new, comes into the world and a lot opposes Jesus. The old opposes the new. So now let's read a very long text. It's the whole of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three, different approach. I have put in color some of the things that I'd like you to notice. And what I'd like you to notice is who is the opposition and how do they go about opposing Jesus? So we begin. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can give forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. 
Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiatar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good? or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill. But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Five episodes of opposition. I would say not just opposition, but mounting opposition. From episode to episode, the violence of the scene increases. So let's ask some general questions. In the weeks to come, we will be going back to each text and looking at it in much more detail as we've done in the past. But tonight I want to give an overview because Mark writes very carefully and in a very structured way. So again, there is something to be seen with an overview of these five episodes. Let's look at them again. This is the opposition. Who says to whom about whom? So in the first, you remember, the scribes say to whom? Well, they're not saying it to anyone, in fact. They are speaking in their hearts. They are not yet voicing. And they are speaking about Jesus. In the second, Again, you remember the first story was about the man who has been laid before Jesus, paralyzed. And Jesus, interestingly, says, your sins are forgiven. That is what uh, provokes the opposition, the opposition here being the scribes. But they don't, say, they don't say out aloud what they think, thinking about Jesus. In the second, the scribes are the Pharisees. Again, it's the scribes, now defining them as those that serve the Pharisees. And they are asking about fasting. Again, this is in the context of the call of Levi. Levi invites Jesus, sorry, not about fasting, but about the, the feasting. Uh, the uh, Levi has invited Jesus to his home. And they see Jesus sitting with sinners with tax collectors and prostitutes. That's what provokes them. But they ask their question now, announced, but to the disciples, talking about Jesus. In the third episode, 
the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast. And so the people come to Jesus. Again, first time they come to Jesus and they speak out their query. But they are not asking about Jesus. They are asking about the disciples. Why do your disciples not fast? Again, this is the central episode. We will come back to this in two weeks' time. It's very important to read through that slowly and understand the dynamic. But all I want to do tonight is to point out this center, the center here, which doesn't exactly fit, but is actually the turning point when we begin to understand what this is all about, about the cloth that is sewn on and tears and the wineskins that burst, describing in parables the relationship between the new and the old. Very central to the message of Mark, but we will have to come back there in two weeks' time. And then the fourth episode, we now have, you see the scribes, the scribes of the Pharisees, the people about the disciples of John and the Pharisees against the disciples of Jesus. And now we have the Pharisees. And the Pharisees observe the disciples of Jesus walking through the field and picking grain and eating it. And again, they turn to Jesus, but they don't ask about Jesus. They ask about the disciples. And then finally, in the last episode, the last episode of the man with the dried up hand, Jesus is again in the synagogue. We can understand by the context that this is probably again the synagogue in Capernaum. And he looks with anger at those who are there to catch him out. They say nothing. Their decision is made. They will go out to destroy Jesus. So, the opposition, what are they saying? Before we go into the details of what they are saying, I'd like to point out that the issues that are raised are legitimate. We'll see that when we look at the content. But in order to understand what is going on, one needs to understand who Jesus is. This is really at the center. And the opposition is asking legitimate questions, but not asking Jesus, who Jesus is, so that they can understand what is going on. I repeat again what I've already said, the new and the old, in those two parables about the tear and the burst wineskins, are at the very center. And this will slowly be revealed as we go over the text over the next few weeks. So what is the opposition saying? What is said? So in the first, again, we go back, you remember, Jesus has just said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And in their hearts, without enunciating what they're thinking, they're saying, what the hell is going on? Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, that is absolutely true. What they are saying is true. Only God can forgive sins. They have not said out aloud their query. They have not engaged with Jesus to understand who Jesus is. In the second, they come and they see Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Remember, they do not approach him to ask him. They go to his disciples and they say, and this is what is said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, something has failed here. Jesus is doing something that provokes a reaction and provokes within the context of the time, within the law that is understood by those people. He shouldn't be eating with tax collectors and sinners. He shouldn't be mixing with them. Why is he doing it? A very legitimate question. But they don't ask Jesus. They are not engaging with Jesus. They ask the disciples. And then the next. They 
are asking, why do your disciples not fast? This is the people who have come and saying, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Again, perfectly legitimate question. Fasting is an important discipline for John's disciples, the disciples of the Pharisees, for the people of the time. And Jesus' disciples are feasting. Once again, if they asked Jesus who he is, they would understand as Jesus tries to tell them, despite the fact that Jesus was not asked. And that will be followed by the revealing parables of the new and the old. Then in the fourth episode, Walking in the Fields, the Pharisees see and say, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? They are talking to Jesus, but they are not asking who Jesus is. They are not engaging with who Jesus is, with his identity. They are pointing fingers at the disciples. Of course, these disciples are disciples of Jesus. And in order to understand the surprising thing that they are doing, picking grain on the Sabbath and eating it, they would need to understand what is this new quantity that has entered the equation? Who is this Jesus? And then finally, in the last episode, and it is a very, very difficult episode once we read it slowly and understand what is going on. Jesus is back in the synagogue, and there is a man with a withered hand, and they are there watching. Their silence, which is underlined in the text, is to illustrate that they have already decided that the new is to be rejected. The new must be destroyed. You notice now why I say there is this mounting opposition. Mark skillfully tells five stories about Jesus, five episodes where the mounting opposition to Jesus takes us already to the cross, for they go out to destroy him. What is being described is absolutely contrary to what we saw in chapter one. In chapter one, Jesus was the hero. He succeeded in all that he did. He called his disciples and they came to him immediately. And then he went into the synagogue in Capernaum and chased out the demon that had possessed the man in the synagogue. Then he went out into Peter's house, Simon Peter's house, and cured Simon's mother-in-law. And then the sick and those possessed were brought to him at when night fell, and he cured them all. Jesus is the hero. He can do whatever he sets his mind to do. But needless to say, that is not the story of the Jesus that we follow. The Jesus we follow is the man who died on the cross. The cross is a failure. Of course, we do understand that it is revealed as the greatest success, but that success passes through failure, through death. And here in these five episodes, we have a description of Jesus's failure to engage those who come to challenge him. They murmur in their hearts. They do not speak out aloud their legitimate question in order to engage Jesus and understand who he is. They ask the disciples about him, or they ask him about the disciples. And finally, in that very difficult and violent text, they say nothing. Here we are entering into the mystery of who Jesus is. This man endowed with divine authority. This man who can and does perform miracles 
acts of power. This man endowed with authority is refused by too many a human heart. And Jesus' attempt is to provoke them to ask him, who are you? Who are you so that we might understand and perhaps follow you? So again, this is just a summary of these five episodes. We will be coming back to the five episodes over the next few weeks in order to look at the dynamic closer, in order once again to appreciate how carefully Mark chooses his language to describe what is going on, how he takes us deep into the mystery of who Jesus is. But before we do move on to study the texts, I want to discuss a little the problematic, the hermeneutic problematic, the problematic of interpretation that is, of course, much a part of our heritage in reading the Gospels. Or oh, the books of the Gospels, sorry. I just broke out in rash from my own pronunciation of that horrible word, gospel in plural. So let's first go through who is the opposition to Jesus in Mark? And you see, I put in the first place, we already saw that last week in reading the final episode of that first day when Jesus, after the first day, goes out to the, out to the wilderness and the disciples hunt him down to bring him back to Capernaum. That was just a hint. We are not yet into the heart of the disciples' opposition to Jesus, but we will get there. We will get there. And that's a very central part of the story. Tonight, we focused on the scribes, or as they are described in the, uh, in the second episode, the scribes of the Pharisees and the Pharisees. And at the very end of this section on opposition, there are also mentioned the Herodians. These are all different types of leadership in the community of Jesus. The scribes are those who carefully pour over the law, the Torah. And of course, they're called scribes because they write it, they copy it. Remember the enormous effort that goes into producing the scrolls, which can then be studied, read, and memorized. The Pharisees, one of the groups of religious leaders at the time. Okay, I'm not going to go into a long description of who the Pharisees are, but they are very concerned with trying to live strictly the law. Already I want to say that the Pharisees, as they described in the gospel, the four books of the gospel, are not the Pharisees of history. So again, we make a distinction here. The writers of the story of Jesus are writing all of these groups as opposition to Jesus and not as an objective historian would see the Pharisees as one of the groups that is uh, offering to the people a form of religious life, which many of the people find attractive. The Herodians are those that support the house of Herod. They are already mentioned here. We'll come to stories uh, in chapter six about Herod and the execution of John the Baptist. The Herodians, of course, support a dynasty. Later on, we will see also the chief priests, the elders of the people, the Sadducees, a parallel group to the Pharisees, perhaps stricter, perhaps more elitist, perhaps less interested in developing a popular, popular form of, of the Jewish tradition. But all the same, it needs to be stressed that as these groups are written in the gospel, they are written with the principal purpose of being the opposition to Jesus. They are literary characters in the gospel to oppose Jesus. And then, of course, the people. You noticed that in the third episode, it's not the uh, scribes, not the scribes of the Pharisees, but the people who come to question Jesus, and they will play a very important part 
afterwards as opposition to Jesus, whether the people is the Jewish people or the people is the Romans, are the Roman occupation and actually those who decide on Jesus' death. So the opposition to Jesus is in Mark has different forms. And as we move later through the Gospel of Mark, we will see how this opposition is over and over again described. But you see, I've put at the beginning that the principal opposition to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is the disciples. That's us. That's why I put here down at the bottom, us. I think Mark, more than he is concerned with the historical opposition to Jesus or how he translates that historical opposition into literary opposition, what really concerns him is how we have such a hard time entering into an intimate relationship with Jesus and discovering who he is. So that by listening to him, by watching his example, by following him, we can become like he is and spread his message in the world. Now, needless to say, Christians have found it difficult sometimes to accept that perhaps the most useful way to read the gospel is to read it as a confession of our own failings, whether we see ourselves as the disciples or we understand that those disciples are in fact us. And we have tended through the ages to point fingers, to point fingers at the Jews. Interestingly, not so much at the Romans, but at the Jews. And so I'd like to read tonight so that as we go through later the texts about the opposition, we don't fall into the trap of doing what too many Christians over 2,000 years have done, and that is pointed fingers at the Jews, those scribes, those Pharisees, those Herodians, those chief priests, those elders, those Sadducees, that Jewish people that rejected Jesus. And let's now read what the Catholic Church has been teaching us since the Council. And I want to read here certain sections from the document Nostra Aetate in our times, the document on how the church, the church's position on members of other faiths. The longest paragraph in that document that treats also the church's stand on Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, traditional religions, etc. The longest paragraph is on the Jewish people. In fact, in the genesis of the document, that was the purpose of the document. After centuries of a teaching of contempt towards the Jews, based upon a wrong reading of the gospel, a reading that we do not want to engage in, the Second Vatican Council took it as its task, I believe inspired by the Holy Spirit, to state clearly that there is a wrong reading of the gospel. So let's read just these sections from paragraph four. As Holy Scripture testifies, Jerusalem did not recognize the time of her visitation nor did the Jews in large number accept the gospel. Indeed, not a few opposed its spreading. Nevertheless, God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers. He does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues, such is the witness of the apostle. The apostle is Paul. In company with the prophets and the same apostle, Paul, the church awaits the de that day known to God alone, on which all peoples will address the Lord in a single voice and serve him shoulder to shoulder. True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. Although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected 
or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. All should see to it then, that in catechetical work or in the preaching of the word of God, they do not teach anything that does not conform to the truth of the gospel and the spirit of Christ. Now again, I repeat, what we will be doing in the next three weeks is going back over these texts in order to read them carefully, in order to fully understand the dynamic that is there in the brilliant writing of Mark as he presents to us who Jesus is. Again, the dynamic is not to enter into the engagement with Jesus to discover who he is. We have just read this text published in 1965 so that we do not fall into the trap of too easily pointing a finger at those who do not enter into the relationship with Jesus, when in fact what Mark probably is desirous of us to do is to see how we ourselves have such difficulty entering into that intimate relationship with the one who calls us to follow him, to listen deeply to his words and to transform our lives so that we conform more and more to his image and likeness. Before we take on the questions, remembering again, that is the Feast of St. Mark, I'd like to take a few moments where we can reflect on what we've heard. And then of course, please write your comments, questions, queries, whatever you like into the chat, and we'll have a time for discussion. But in order to do that, let's go back to the prayer, the prayer of those Coptic Christians on this Feast of St. Mark, as they proclaim, Christ is risen. Give me an amkutha. Baisan fil gulgutha wa shamsur raga ilahat wa rabbul masihu qam. Oh, 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 oh. 
Okay, so I see that we do have some, some comments in the chat. So Ursula? So um, Margaret wishes you a happy feast day. Thank you. The beginning. Um, Stephen asks, do you think that Mark's audience might have heard the story as directed against the Jews, just as many Christians since have done? That is a difficult question to answer because it goes back, of course, to the whole question of who the audience is. Now, we are aware from the writings of Paul, particularly in the Epistle to the Romans in chapters 9 to 11, that there is already a beginning of a, a contempt for the Jewish people by uh, people who have followed Jesus from the Gentiles. Paul in chapters 9 to 11 describes uh, that, um, or rather says very strongly to those um, believers from the Gentiles that they must not be arrogant. And we do not have time here to go into uh, this ex extremely important text written at the beginning of the 60s that, in fact, the Nostra Aetate document is making reference to when it talks about the apostle, where Paul insists that God's promise to the Jewish people is an eternal promise, that their election is for always. But he doesn't only say that. He says also that it is part of God's plan that the Jewish people did not accept Jesus so that Jesus could be proclaimed to the Gentiles. In a certain sense, I understand him to say that Gentiles should give thanks for that Jewish refusal because without it, Jesus would not have been proclaimed beyond the confines of the Jewish people. Of course, the aim of God is that now that the Gentiles have believed in Jesus, they will be able to conform to Jesus's image and be Jesus for Jews so that in them, the Jewish people can recognize Jesus. Of course, that's pretty much the opposite of what happened for too much of Christian history. Last week, we mentioned that in Israel, it was Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, we realize that our witness has not been the witness that it should be. And again, it goes back to the fundamental message of Mark. Those that put an obstacle on the way of Jesus, those who are the ones who absolutely betray Jesus, are the ones who are his disciples. And there is much to meditate on in that message in our church today. So thank you for that question. Again, not easy to know who is the audience of Mark, but I do believe that this teaching of contempt that Paul is already combating in the 60s is beginning to take root. Notice another thing that is important to notice, that until the end of the first century, most of those writing about Jesus were Jews who believed in Jesus. They were angry that their brothers and sisters who were Jewish did not come to faith in Jesus as they had. The big change, though, will come in the second century when we almost have no uh, Christian writers who are of Jewish origin. And that will pose a huge challenge for the church. And ah, that's a whole nother chapter that we can discuss another time. Uh, Don says, um, it is interesting to note that Jesus was being shadowed by the Pharisees right from the beginning of his mission. Maybe initially to listen to his wisdom, but they soon realized that he was ushering in a different philosophy based on love and compassion and not laws. Jesus threatened the current order of things and possibly the livelihoods of the Pharisees. Could you comment on that? Don, yes, I will comment. And if you allow me, I'll be not very polite. Okay. I think, again, we must go back to something I said, which is foundational in not falling into a trap. The Pharisees, who might or might not be shadowing Jesus, certainly by the end of chapter three, they are shadowing Jesus. Again, there is a increase 
in um, ominous tones from the beginning of chapter two to the end to the beginning of chapter three. Yes, they are a literary character. Let's be very careful when we make statements like Jesus came to preach love and they preached law. When we read some of the writings of the Jewish authorities in the first century, people like Hillel, people like Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, we realize that there is much more in common between what Jesus is teaching and what the Pharisees are teaching than we would believe if we only had the Gospels as a source. Again, remember, the opposition to Jesus is a literary creation of Mark. And at the very heart of that opposition is an existential opposition, which is my opposition to Jesus. Again, we don't want to fall into the trap of speaking a language that is contempt of Judaism and the Jewish people. So, yes, in the gospel narrative, the opposition is strongly against Jesus. And we're going to focus on that next week as we read again the first and last episodes of these five episodes. We'll see there uh, the enormous internal opposition that becomes violence by the end of our section in chapter 3, verse 6. They go out to destroy him. But I think that before we try to turn that into some kind of historical statement, we must go back to what is the genre of literature that Mark is writing. He's not writing history. He's actually translating the kerygma, the, the proclamation of the kingdom into a narrative form so that we ourselves can be converted. Again, this might not all be absolutely clear uh, today, but I'm hoping as that we go into detail and look at the role that these Jewish leaders play, we'll be able to distinguish more and more clearly between the historical Jesus and the opposition that the historical Jesus met. After all, he was crucified. And the dynamic that is being described in this work, which is theological, it is spiritual, and it is narrative, but not necessarily historical. I think you've also just answered um, Errol's question, which was the shadowing not part of God's plan. Who would have been able to bring Jesus before Pilate, if not the Pharisees? And exactly. You've answered that. Now, yeah. again, there is another part of Nostra Aetate that I did not read because I saw the time was running. I think it's very important to recognize that in all of the books of the gospel, uh, the fate of Jesus is a fate that he must accomplish, and he gives himself to that fate. Uh, we believe that we are saved by the death of Jesus, so that before we point too many fingers, uh, we must realize that Jesus is embracing a fate uh, that he must accomplish in order to bring our salvation. So I'm not sure that that is what Eric meant when he said the shadowing is a necessity, not just the shadowing, but the conspiracy and the handing over Jesus to Pilate is a necessity in order to accomplish this plan, this very mysterious plan of God, whereby Jesus will be hoisted onto a cross. Again, Mark will make no secret that when we gaze on G at Jesus on the cross, what we are called to do is to repent, not point fingers, but to recognize how we are complicit in the betrayal of Jesus. And again, remember, enemy number one in the Gospel of Mark, the only one who is called Satan in the Gospel of Mark is going to be Simon Peter, the disciple. It is the disciples who are focused on as the major obstacle on Jesus's road. Um, Nontando uh, says, this is a profoundly rich discussion for me. I've been deeply challenged by the reality that I too oppose Jesus. 
that the resistance of Jesus coming and being not, as I think, creates resistance to deeper revelation of who Jesus is. It reminds me when I first encountered Rastafarians with dreadlocks and smoking weed and calling God Yah, everything in me rebelled and thinking of it now, I see myself identifying with the Pharisees. Wow, I'm deeply processing this profound message. Thank you. And I thank you. I thank you very, very much. Again, it's part of our need to recognize that we need Jesus, uh, that we are those that are being addressed. And Jesus comes to awaken in us that need. So thank you for sharing that. I think that that is absolutely what I was trying to say. It's also, of course, and here goes again, uh, the Mark Paul connection. Uh, chapter 7 in the Epistle to the Romans describes where we are. I know what I need to do in terms of the narrative. I know that I need to follow Jesus. I know that I need to listen to Jesus, but everything in me rebels against it. So I do not do what I know that I must do. That internal struggle is the internal struggle of a disciple a disciple gazing at Jesus and recognizing the rebellion I inside. So here, yes, the opposition, for the meantime, are them, the Jewish leaders, portrayed once again as a literary character. At the very center of the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 8, that is all going to be reattributed to the disciples so that we more fully recognize that we are the ones in need constantly of conversion. Um, we've reached eight o'clock, but there's two more questions and perhaps they're related, perhaps not. Uh, I'll just okay. quickly. So what are or is the core reason why Jews still do not accept Jesus as their Messiah? Okay. And then Rebecca's wondering, but perhaps it's a different thing. Is there any way where it's described what the signs would be for the arrival of the Messiah? It seems that the approach of Jesus is not welcomed and not understood for the people to see that he is the Messiah. Okay, those are both very complicated questions. We don't have time yeah. to really delve into them. But I do want to say one thing about why do the Jews not recognize Jesus? And it's going to be ch a challenge. It's a provocation, okay? It's not a cool, collected theological statement. It's a challenge to each one of us. Jesus is not here now, except if we make him visible. Do we? When a Jew meets us, is a Jew meeting Jesus? Because if we want the Jews to know Jesus, how are they going to know him ex except through the witness that we give? Now, of course, we can look over the long centuries of the witness that was given by Christians and see, well, there was a lot lacking there. The question today is, are we witnessing as we should? Again, the Jews, I think we need to trust that God is in charge and that God is leading the Jewish people leading us, leading everyone to God's kingdom. But if we really do want to try and understand something in that strange mystery, and Paul calls it a mystery, the mystery of Israel, I think we really do need to ask, am I being as Christ-like as I can to my Jewish neighbor, to my Muslim neighbor, to my atheist neighbor, to all whom I meet? And if we really believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, then we must ask, are we conformed to Jesus' image and likeness? Again, I'm not saying that I'm giving the full answer of why Jews don't believe in Jesus. Um, the two questions are, in a sense, linked. What are the signs? Certainly, the Jews did not think, no one thought at that time, that the sign would be a crucified Messiah. But we'll get to those places as well as we continue to study uh, the wonderful Gospel of Mark. And so thank you very much for being out with us again. Please come back next week because we will be going back to the first episode and the last episode next week in order to look more closely at what exactly is going on. And so I wish you all once again a very blessed feast. <laughs>
of St. Mark. God bless and hope to meet you next week.